Hello and welcome back to Street Crime UK. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more UK true crime content. Today we look at Mr Bobby Cummins. He was born to a family of eight. Mr Cummins grew up in a tight-knit community in North London. His father worked as a bricklayer and both of his parents were on the straight and narrow, meaning that they never committed crime. In his own words, crime wasn't seen as crime, it was survival. Petty theft was used to feed families, and as long as you didn't steal from your own, it was allowed. Despite the underlying danger, the community remained close. Everyone's doors were always open to each other, and you always had a meal waiting for you. It was a culture of taking care of your own, and this idea of supporting those you saw as your own persisted in Cummins' ethos for decades. Cummins was slapped with his first criminal offence when he was just 15 years old. After witnessing two policemen roughing around with a group of kids his age, he simply commented that there should be an adult present. This resulted in the men planting a cutthroat razor on Cummins and hauling him into the station. Faced with pleading guilty or going to juvenile detention, he pled guilty at the begging of his father, who refused to believe that the police had done him in. The story made local news and Cummins subsequently lost his job due to his new criminal record. Enraged, Cummins made a vow that if the world wanted to see him as bad, then he would show him how bad he really could be. Cummins had two choices laid before him. Join his father as a bricklayer, or make his own way. Having left school at 16, Cummins didn't have the education to do anything else. So Cummins chose the latter option, and thus started his criminal career. Meeting with the local firms, Cummins was quick to establish himself as a powerhouse, helping organise the previously jumbled up groups on the condition that it would be on his terms. In the 60s, 70s and 80s, crime in North London was much more organised than its modern counterparts today. A complex web of interpersonal relationships between groups allowed for quick dissemination of information, techniques and the quick discovery of young people they could possibly recruit. The structured system allowed for a sort of criminal code of ethics to be kept in place. No killing members of the media, the general population, or the government. And there were rules surrounding the actual hit, such as making sure it wasn't done in the presence of wives or children. It was through this web of contacts that after proving himself and earning their respect, Cummins obtained his notorious sawn-off shotgun, which he affectionately named Kennedy. The power that came with wielding a firearm and his growing reputation drew the attention of the older gangsters, who took him to be a hitman. During the time he was trained to be a hitman, Cummins was taught to tamp down his emotions and dehumanise his targets. Most importantly, he realised that not all of the hitmen he interacted with were heartless cyborgs with antisocial personality disorders. Many of them were, in fact like him, had learned to numb themselves to their actions out of survival rather than insanity. They were groomed into the role by the older group and taught to view their targets as rats rather than as humans. Those killings weren't personal, it was just work to him. He also saw his actions as a necessary evil. There were times where a full-blown gang war was on the horizon, and those orchestrating the violence needed to be taken out before they were successful. The one death that Cummins says he continues to live with is the accidental death of a hostage during a bank robbery, who choked on his own gag. The near clinical amount of preparation involved in the hits went past just conditioning the hitmen in training. They learned how to change their modus of operandi, consistently to avoid being detected by law enforcement. They would read books and watch interviews of hitmen that had been caught and learn how they had been caught. Some even go into jail to learn from the best directly. When preparing for a hit, they would stalk their targets, learning their daily patterns as they searched for their witnesses' weak spot, something that they could exploit moments where they were alone and vulnerable, or how to make it look like an accidental death, even down to poison and insulin overdosing. Cummins became one of the UK's youngest bank robbers at the age of 16. He was sent to jail for armed robbery where he found himself being brutalised by the people rather than rehabilitated. It was the opposite effect of what should have happened. Instead of being shown the error of his ways and the path that he was headed down, he realised that the only way to solve violence was with more violence. He quickly learned that being tough gave you a voice in the world, and continued his criminal education with the Cray Twins. When he left jail, the rage inside of him had just grown and grown. He showed no signs of wanting to quit crime, and his notoriety had only grown since leaving prison. He began extorting restaurants for protection money. Some of the attacks he actually orchestrated himself, and all of this was at the age of 17. 
He moved on to fearlessly threatening larger gangs to stay away from his neighbourhood when they tried to move in. And Cummins was known for introducing himself with a pound note and a bullet on the table, promising one or the other based on the loyalty shown to him. Eventually, Cummins found his way to prison to serve a 12 year sentence for offences, including manslaughter and bank robbery. During this time, he became labelled a Category A prisoner due to his constant rule breaking. He started numerous riots and sit ins while loaning money to fellow prisoners at exorbitant interest rates. He even went so far as to hold a governor hostage with a blade after they refused to do anything about the abuse being inflicted upon them by the inmates and by the correctional officers. Cummins spent time jumping around maximum security prisons, but was eventually cordoned off with the rest of the most dangerous inmates at Parkhurst. It was here that he called to negotiate a truce between the notorious Reggie Cray and Charlie Richardson, and where things began to change. Charlie Richardson, a prominent member of South London's torture gang, was surprisingly the voice of reason when he met Bobby. He convinced Mr Cummins that if he stayed on the track he was on, he'd end up with a life sentence or dead. Charlie said, education would be what would set you free. He said if you were educated, he could go clean and possibly even start your own business. With the added urgence of Reggie Cray, Cummins began taking courses at the Open University on sociology and psychology trying to learn more about why he was the way he was, perhaps to bolster his interest in the topics and to pass the time. Richardson began hosting what he and Cummins called Loon Nights on Thursdays and they would invite all the other inmates for tea to listen to their horrific and often delusion-filled stories. The Open University also offered him something very elusive, contact with the outside world. He would mail in his assignments and they would be returned graded but if he had any questions, he would receive letters in response. He said that it felt like they were there with you when you were in prison. This became pivotal in his later activism, and he focused on educating those whom he worked with. Cummins began writing poetry and reading, which is how he eventually met and fell in love with his first wife, the prison's librarian. This new family became the impetus for him to clean up his act. With a wife and a baby on the way, he was determined never to force his daughter to endure visiting him in jail. When he was released in 1988, he left the criminal world behind. It wasn't easy. Of course, he applied for jobs under his full name rather than the name he was notorious for, and wrote himself fake letters of recommendation. He worked the night shift at Tesco's, stocking shelves before he was fired for threatening to gouge the manager's eyes out. After many more menial jobs, Cummins discovered what would become his life focus. At the request of an old parole officer, Cummins spoke to two troubled teenagers who were on a path similar to the very one he'd found himself on decades earlier. Something clicked in Bobby, and he began speaking to more and more delinquents and fellow ex-convicts, encouraging them to stay on the clean path and helping where he could. The old sense of community that had been a pinnacle of his childhood stirred. It's my kids and they're dying in the streets, my mothers that are crying in the slums, and the politicians are still lying. He became volunteer of the month at the charity that he was working with, and as soon as he could start his own charity, Cummins became a chief executive of the charity Unlock, which worked to uphold the rights of convicts in all areas of civilian life and liberties. They championed police amendments and additions, and created directories of banks, insurance offices, universities, and other institutions that didn't discriminate against people with previous criminal convictions. However, Mr. Cummins stepped away to work more directly with people. Cummins was mostly comfortable with having a hands-on approach with his advocacy, speaking directly to schools, colleges, and inmates. And this type of approach was desperately needed. The world of crime was drastically changing compared to what it once was, morphing into something a lot wilder and dangerous. The code of ethics that was once followed was no more, and the respect needed to earn to buy a gun is no longer needed. These days, common drug dealers carry guns, and anyone will take out a hit for only a couple of grand. Instead of sitting and mourning the worsening state of the crime underworld and what he had been through, Cummins chose instead to continue with his charity work and attempted to solve the problems by talking directly to the teenagers being affected. He focused on dissuading them of the supposedly glamorous world of crime, condemning the way the entertainment industry had glorified it. 
Cummins details in interviews that you could never really trust anyone in the crime world. Anyone could want the reputation that would come by killing someone of this kind of standing, or anyone could decide that he had become a liability and needed to be taken out. And this isn't just stemming from paranoia. Cummins has had at least three assassination attempts that we know of, including being shot in the leg, being stabbed in the stomach, and he used to lie in bed wondering if a petrol bomb would just come through the window, and he thought he'd be dead by 30 years old. His charity work began to catch politicians' attention, and Cummins was asked to serve as an advisor to many government officials, including members of the parliament and judges. He worked as an advisor on inquiries into the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, and as an expert witness in prisoner education. But none of this did anything to stay his tongue and hide his honest opinions, openly calling a member of the House of Lords a gangster. He never hid his detaste at working with people who would rather invest in bombs than in children's futures. And this bluntness was what inevitably made him an excellent advisor. He pointed out the flaws of the penal system, such as how high security prisons were breeding grounds for abuse and for great minds to conspire and share illegal tips and tricks with a more vulnerable crowd of young convicts. The free-for-all nature needed to be checked so that maximum securities wouldn't be havens for criminal education. If the UK actually wanted to reform its criminals, it needed to start at square one. Cummins campaigned to ensure the basic necessities that would break the cycle of reoffending. At this time, banks could refuse to open accounts for ex-convicts or give them loans, and jobs could discriminate, and insurance could be denied. Access to education was crucial in Cummins' mind, and he advocates for the education to inmates. After leaving Unlock, he started his own charity, Midas, with Charlie Richardson, the man who first helped him get on the right track. He continues to work with his charity to promote the education of the former offender community and to help with employment opportunities. For his work, Mr Cummins was awarded an OBE by Queen Elizabeth II. Using his own experiences, Mr. Cummins connected with troubled teenagers and worked directly with them to nudge them in the right direction, just like he did all those years ago when his friends were harassed by the police. His belief in the goodness of people led him to clean up and begin working with teenagers and adults with criminal backgrounds. Because of the tireless and compassionate work of Bobby Cummins and people like him, ex-convicts are able to open up bank accounts, have access to health insurance, and so many other basic things they need to stay on the right side of the law and lower the statistic of reoffending convicts, giving many a chance at a safe life they otherwise wouldn't have had. Thanks again for joining us today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the video if you enjoyed it. And as always, stay safe.